WNYC-TV presents About the Arts with Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Our guest today is John V. Lindsay, who's past, present, and future remain an endless source of fascination and speculation to all New Yorkers. Today, however, we're going to focus on his present. And because of the focus of this program, in particular, your interest and concern with the arts. What do we begin at the beginning? And that is, I guess, along about the early 1960s when you were a congressman in Washington and a very early signatory to the legislation that helped form what is now the National Endowment for the Arts. It's come a long way, not only in terms of its uh, scope and direction, but its funding as well. From less than $2 million, it, the Carter administration has applied for a $150 million budget for the next year for that endowment. Did you ever conceive of such a multiplying rate for this agency. What did you envision when you were a sponsor of that? Well, uh, Barbara Lee, when, the, when I first introduced the bill, and I was working with uh, Frank Thompson, Congressman Frank Thompson from New Jersey on the matter. It was just the two of us at that time. Nobody else uh, had much interest. And uh, we, f we first did not think the bill would ever go through the Congress. And ultimately, we achieved its passage. It took quite a while. But we're going back now to the early 60s, um, 1963 uh, and 4. Yes. And uh, one reason it went through was that we did have the support of the then administration in Washington. They finally endorsed the bill. And I'm not sure it would have made it otherwise, but we, none of us, neither uh, Frank uh, nor I, um, could believe then that it would be possible that we'd now be in, 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 the, in the shape that we're in with a government that really does care about the arts, that uh, the requested appropriations are that large, and what? that it is really doing some good around the nation. What direction would you like to see it take, the NEA, the NEH, the Museum Services Institute, this growing federal bureaucracy? Always a danger, Barbara and uh, every time you, every time you set up an instrument, uh, an instrumentality in Washington or any other government, you run the risk of creating a, uh, some kind of a bureaucracy with which it's going to be increasingly difficult to deal. I think that in respect of the National Endowment, although it is it has uh, been subject to some of that kind of thing, that because it's had generally good management, uh, it's been more free of it than have a lot of other bureaucracies in Washington, freer than the post office, freer than regulatory agencies and all the rest. Um, I don't know why it is that we Americans are so bad at these things, at the administration of it. The British are so much better at it. Well, maybe they have a and longer even, tradition, and even the French, more experience. Even the French are better at it than, than we are in respect of, of the um, of the uh, nonsense that we set up that is an impediment to decision making and everything else. I, I do think that for a while uh, the endowment in Washington became subject to s too much pressure from too many little groups and too many congressional special interests so that every congressman from around the nation was putting pressure on for, for uh, uh, funding for uh, institutions in their own districts that were not ready for funding. And uh, uh, this is an area where you can't use one man, one vote. But this we have is an that area kind of where formula in New York State where we have yes, 55 and, cents per person. And the person. same thing has happened in New York State. And, I'm, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's wise, because I do think that uh, uh, it's very important that you continue to push for excellence. And you do have to make choices between what is the better and what is the merely reasonably good. Well, I think you touch on what is perhaps the central philosophical debate in the arts now, and that is what is sometimes referred to as elitism versus populism, that broad reaching out to involve wider numbers of people. And if we are using public funds, should we not be using them in a way that benefits the widest number of people? Uh, where are you in that issue? Well, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's a narrow line. 
there has to be a balance there. Obviously, you can't put uh, public monies totally into the Lincoln centers of this world uh, as badly as they need it. Um, but the Lincoln centers of this world are deserving of some help at the same time. The Metropolitan Opera in New York uh, would be, might be even dark now, but for some help it's received from the endowment in Washington. And uh, it would have been a disaster if that had happened. And that's exactly what uh, Frank uh, Thompson and I had in mind when we set this thing up, which, uh, which was to, to make it impossible for institutions of high quality to die. Well, how do you get excellence and, with access? Uh, and let's go back to the British for mm -hmm. a moment. It would be unthinkable in, in Great Britain, from which we inherited most of our traditions, our Bill of Rights and our Charters of Freedom and everything else and our rule of law and the common law, it would be unthinkable for them to allow uh, the Shakespeare Festival or what's equivalent to our Shakespeare Festival to, to go down. And it is heavily supported by uh, the national government in Great Britain. Similarly, it would be unthinkable for our government to allow an institution of the quality of the uh, Metropolitan Opera to be lost. That's not to say, however, that you should not balance that off with a, what you call a populist approach. There are those who are always going to say the metropolitan opera of this world is, is elitist. Um, I think that's an oversimplification myself. And uh, uh, there's much to be said well, for, best, the, for the competition of high quality. Much to be said for the, for the existence of the metropolitan opera. Just I hate to dwell on that. Um, was an incentive for all parts of the country. To, to begin the process by which they built opera houses and had good opera groups and uh, whatnot because of the competition involved. It's the same thing with private education and public education. P uh, pri private education deserves to be supported somehow because of the standard that it sets. Well, some critics of this revolution, this expansion of the arts, feel that perhaps we don't need quite so many dance companies. Perhaps we don't need quite so many opera companies, but fewer and more excellent ones. I would come down more on that side than I would on the other side. That's why I think that's the point I was trying to make a moment ago, Barbara Lee, when I said that, the, that there has been a problem with the shotgun approach of the National Endowment, just like there has in New York State, mm -hmm. to satisfy every political pressure that is there. And I don't think you can do that. I think that even government and the allocation of public funds has got to make choices, set priorities, and on the whole support quality and excellence rather than allow it to be dissipated and therefore uh, diffused and maybe lowered in quality. The most recent bombshell actually in New York State relates to an episode of several weeks ago and that is that one of the subsidiaries of the New York State Council of the Arts, subsidiary because the State Council cannot give grants to individuals, but CAPS can, uh, and by its usual panel review system of experts, awarded a grant of $5,000 to a photographer. That photographer published a book that I think is called Sex Objects. As a result, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee has called to task the very able chairwoman of the New York State Council to know why public funds are used in that fashion. Is that reminiscent of some national debates? Yeah, the same thing has happened nationally to some extent, and it's happened here. And you're absolutely right that the chairwoman uh, of the New York State Council is enormously able. We're uh, talking about Kitty Hart. Kitty <laughs> Hart, and Kitty Hart is uh, uh, is really one of the great people. And she and Dorothy Rogers, Mrs. Richard Rogers, have provided more great substance and leadership to the State Council than is imaginable. I mean, they, well, how do they what, answer what we, that what charge? What the whole state owes them is, uh, is immeasurable for in, in gratitude for how taking do, on a, a thankless task in many ways. Well, how should they answer this charge when this young man, judged by a jury of his peers, first-rate photographers, was awarded a modest grant, and uh, the charge now is, is this an appropriate use of public funds? Obviously, what his proposal asked to do a sociological photo documentary, certainly in the tradition of things that have appeared in museums over a very extended period of time. Do you see an increasing danger with anything like that when you have that much money, when the state now gives $27 million about, it is to be hoped, to be increased to $34 million, this whole specter of censorship? Well, it's a, you've touched upon a very sensitive arena, 
um, who's to judge what is art and what is not art? And then you get into the First Amendment problem of freedom of expression, which is a, a sacred uh, protective arrangement under our Constitution. Uh, by, but at the same token, um, you have to understand that the public is not going to support, and there will be a there will be a reaction to it that could be very counterproductive in the long run. Is not going to support um, the use of taxpayers' dollars in something that they perceive to be less than quality. If it's perceived to be pornography uh, or in bad taste, um, violence or bloodshed uh, or uh, excessive nudity, or whatever you wish to call it, they're not going to support it. And uh, whether those... Well, how does one nurture those, creative freedom? Well, those, those in charge of, mm -hmm. of uh, the handling of public money have got to be very sensitive to this, because um, uh, you are going to, you're going to kill creative freedom if you, if you cause something to be done which causes public outrage. You're not going to win. And I think that those who are in a fiduciary public responsibility in the handling of public funds have got to be very careful and very sensitive to that point. Uh, otherwise, you're going to kill the goose. Actually, I think every, in every administration, every uh, chairperson or executive director of that agency has been very sensitive. One can yeah. only hope that uh, in this instance, it will be just a minor skirmish soon yeah, to be forgotten. Well, they, they have been. Kitty Hart has been enormously sensitive to this problem, I know, as uh, with Mrs. Richard Rogers and mm -hmm. various other people who have been connected with the council. But they, they're unsalaried. They do this as a contribution. Um, they cannot be aware of every single grant that happens. But it, it was a first-rate grant. There, there is going to be mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. is going to escape their immediate full focus and attention. And that's where you get into trouble when this kind of thing happens. And this may have been, I don't know the merits or demerits of this. This is the first I've heard about it, in fact. I didn't know that there was a controversy over this, and I've been traveling a lot. I may have missed the press well, if, hope, there, if there was any. I hope it is but, a thing of the past before we know it. However, in a city like New York that has uh, a very real stake, both for pleasure and economics in its arts life, in fact, I guess culture is one of the great growth industries of New York City, now uh, reckoned it's something like a three and a half billion dollar industry, yeah. it was during your administration that the framework was created for a first Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, that too has come a long way, if not financially, because the funding is similar to the funding during the earliest parts of your administration, certainly an impact. What do you think that the role of culture should play in this city? Well, Barbara, let me say first that you were kind enough to respond immediately to my invitation to be a part of that first council. Um, and you did something very important to, to establish a priority about this city here being an, a cultural center for the nation. Thank you. Um, and it is, very much so. Uh, and uh, God knows we hope it will continue to be. Um, it's not easy. Um, the world of the arts is a, is a very tough world because uh, everyone's money short these days and there aren't the resources that are required to support the arts the way they should be supported. That means you have to be very, you have to use a great deal of ingenuity uh, to keep yourself afloat. Uh, I, can think of, I can think of one magnificent example which is New York City Center which in my days in office uh, was as close to my heart as almost anything else I think. Uh, by law, the mayor is uh, the president of the city center, and I took that enormously seriously, as did uh, one of my predecessors, Mr. LaGuardia, who, who founded it. Um, it's a very important institution, and almost unique in the United States. And uh, it has had very serious money problems. But over the years, it has been virtually impossible for the city government to fund it to subsidize it, and that's always been true. And in fact, the total measure of subsidy, I think, has been the same since almost the days of LaGuardia, which is about $300,000 a year, which is quite a bit. But it's obviously to a huge institution of this kind, which has a ballet, a musical comedy, an opera, um, etc., is, is, is a small amount 
but it's never changed. And I don't think it can get any larger either, particularly with a city as, uh, in as fiscal uh, strenuous condition as New York is. So you cannot say that the local government is going to be able to, quote, subsidize the arts, close quote. It's impossible. Well, where are these new sources of fundings, uh, funding going to come from? Well, um, there are very few. The major source of financing is obviously the federal arrangement, and that we just discussed that. Uh, and, and the uh, multiplication of the amount has been very large indeed, and New York City has been in part a beneficiary of that. And we just mentioned the opera for one thing. There have been the state has been helpful too. There have been uh, suggestions for new sources of funding. For example, airport taxes, hotel taxes, taxes on television sets each of which would bring enormous revenue to the cultural life of this city. Do you approve of any of them, or do I you have any agree. other? I don't agree. I think that, I think that, you've, uh, that you've reached the end of the rope on local taxation. I don't think you can support any more. And uh, a tax on uh, television sets is going to be in another tax on hotels, for example, and you cannot, and uh, our tourist trade is now our number one industry. You can't burden that any longer. Uh, so I don't think that I don't think that local taxation is the answer to this. Uh, uh, I do we think I do think that if sources? you're talking about public monies, mm -hmm. I think your federal and state resources are the only ones left, and even states are are running out of gas to some extent on this. Well, it seems uh, so. You turn to the private sector, and you have you have to get corporate financing, and perhaps foundation financing. Foundations are hard, though, because, as you know, foundations are, are want to introduce seed money only, and they don't like an ongoing kind of contribution, although some of them have struggled to do that, but they've had to justify it to their trustees. I've often thought of the unions as a particularly good source, a potential source of funding for the arts. They do give some money, but not uh, the amount that I would hope they would. I've thought that uh, from time to time unions have fringe benefits of giving a birthday as an additional day off for some of its members. Well, I've thought they should be giving them a birthday present as well, perhaps two tickets to something. Do you see that as a potential source mm. of funding? Um, I, I, I don't want to be the continuing skeptic on this, but I'm a realist and I've lived uh, too long to, uh, with, the, with the problems here to to see, uh, to, to, to be blithe about any, any simple solution to this thing. I don't think it's in the cards to see uh, your union treasuries uh, moving in this area. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that as one of their, as their priorities. I think they're too busy on bread and butter issues at, uh, for the foreseeable future uh, to move into this area. Well, uh, one of the issues that was uh I guess a preserve of the privilege in times past that has more and more moved to the center of concern is that of historic preservation. It's obviously something that I'm deeply yeah. committed to as well. Uh, more and more people see it as not uh, something beyond, I guess, lintels and mullions, but a planning tool. Mm. What do you think the future direction of preservation should be? Well, you're absolutely right in the use of the word planning tool. Preservation is a planning tool of great importance. And uh, in the United States, I do think that New York has been a leader on this subject. In the years that I was in office here, not Washington, um, we were able to change the arrangements and strategy under which you had um, the designation of preservation areas uh, broaden from a one-shot arrangement to a building to a whole block. Historic districts uh, as well. A whole district, in fact, mm -hmm. a whole community. Uh, I think that New York was the leader in the country on that. Not in the world, because if you go to Edinburgh, for example, in Great Britain, there you'll see one of the classic examples of a whole city that has been carefully preserved. You will not see a corruption of its architecture or design, an invasion of any kind and whatnot. It's, it's a magnificent example of what can be done to preserve a, a great, uh, shall I call it, medieval city uh, in its almost original state. Would that be appropriate for a contemporary city? Hard to do in the, uh, in the high voltage atmosphere of, uh, of the United States and it's uh, Houston's and Dallas's and 
Tulsa's and all the rest of it, oh, where their 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 wish for magnificent glass skylines and all the rest of it, and for growth, very difficult to do under the under the pressures for growth in the United States, hard to do. Uh, it's really easier in your older communities like Boston and New York and uh, um, Philadelphia and places like this time. And Charleston. Charleston's done quite an interesting job on this. It's almost easier in these older areas than it is in the in the nouveau areas. The well, how about those people who would like to country. preserve parts of Park in Madison and Fifth Avenue? That's not too easy to do. Not easy to do. Very, very difficult to do. And of course, one of the uh, most controversial uh, developments that ever took place on Park Avenue, just to mention that, of course, was the, the building of the Pan Am building long before I was in office here. Um, and something that was, as you know, widely controversial as to what it was doing to the, the vistas along that particular part of the city. Well, it's an issue in some measure that still goes on with the Grand Central case that has Grand Central case yet is, to be it's resolved. It's still there to be resolved. Some very interesting and important work has been done in, uh, in Brooklyn, in the Brooklyn Heights area particularly. Park Slope. Yep, and Fort Park Green. Slope. Park Slope has been a fascinating uh, experiment yes. in the preservation of brownstones. And uh, that, you're, you're absolutely right, it's a planning tool of great importance. While we're talking about structures, let's talk about Gracie Mansion for a moment. Do you think it's just a symbol, or is it something beyond the mayor's residence? Is it a working office? Should a mayor live there, do you think? It's a, it's a gorgeous and beautiful old building, going back to 1801. Was it 1801? I think it was City Hall. I've forgotten. It was eight, uh, yeah, City Hall no, antedates was, that. Yes. It uh, is 1801, I believe. It was built by Archibald Gracie, a, a very rich Scottish merchant, as his country home. He lived down way downtown in the lower Manhattan area where everybody lived in those days. He had a brownstone. He winded his way up on the water. And he went up on the water for the most part. It was quite an excursion. And that's why Gracie Mansion's front steps faces the water because that's how Archibald Gracie entered his country home. And there was a farm. There were cows and sheep and uh, domestic animals of this kind. Uh, it's a lovely old building and very symbolic. And indeed, without Gracie Mansion, that uh, East Side Highway would have been built along the water's edge instead of tunneled under. So you have an advantage right there mm -hmm. because uh, you've got the water being preserved as a vista uh, and as part of the life of the city. Uh, it is both a place for the mayor's family to live. And I know that Mary and I and our children were very happy there. And Mary wisely made it to a home. And although the children uh, uh, were necessarily helped over the years by the pressures of staff and press and photographers and all the rest of it, she did protect them from it as much as possible. The Susan Wagner wing that was added was a great benefit, because that is a place where it can be used for foreign dignitaries and uh, visitors to this country, ceremonial things, and also a very good cabinet room uh, down below. And equally important is the a very important instant communication system there for the, for the mayor to use with police, fire, emergency services that go 24 hours a day, all night long, and uh, you'd be the mayor of this town would be in, in, uh, in very difficult condition if he didn't have available to him every moment for the, uh, those communication services. For the past four years, we've been the happy beneficiary of your communications, courtesy of ABC Television. Is it correct that you have decided to no longer be a television That's right. interviewer? I have, I have severed uh, with ABC, and, I've, and, I've, and uh, sadly, too, because I've, we had a wonderful relationship, and I enjoyed enormously the, the small amount of work I did. That was very much part-time, and I enjoyed it. And uh, we had a good relationship because we had mutual veto powers. They could ask me to do certain things, and I could say no if I didn't agree. Then why did you leave? And if I asked them to, uh, some things that ought to be, that I thought ought to be explored on television, they could say no if they thought it was, it was uh, not within their, their uh, uh, program. But we worked it out, generally. And I had some fascinating learning experiences on that, particularly in the area of cultural affairs, I may well, say. I know about your George O'Keefe interview, but yeah, why did you George choose to leave? George O'Keefe interview was one of, the, one of the most interesting things I ever did, and it took a lot of boning up and homework to do at the, uh, 
at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in order to get ready for that great interview, which we did at George O'Keefe's home. In Abiquiu? Uh, in Abiquiu. And it was fascinating. Spent, Mary and I spent the night with her. She was kind enough to invite us to spend the night, and we did. And uh, it was a learning experience for all of us to do that. And I, let's see, I, one of the most interesting things I did was the, the Indian exhibition in St. Louis. Um, I did uh, the Brooklyn Museum, several at the Metropolitan Museum. I'm sure you must have done something um, at the Museum of Natural History, your long-term favorite. Uh, no, never made that one, really? uh, regrettably. Did one fascinating, did the first really uh, uh, interesting study of the National Space Museum in Washington, and then uh, did a marvelous piece on the Tutankhamun exhibition when it opened in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and also did one on the marvelous Irish Gold ex exhibition when it opened at the Metropolitan. And those were some of the real highlights of it. The reason, the reason I had to ultimately sever was that I'm basically a, a lawyer and, and uh, the demands of my law firm and the practice, particularly travel in the international field and whatnot, got so big that I had to make a decision one way or the other. And uh, uh, so I had to drop it. Can we look forward to your reappearing on another network? No, no. I've, uh, I've committed myself to the ancient profession of the law, and I, don't, I certainly wouldn't mind doing uh, what I would call one-shot things of this kind, for example, a mini documentary, uh, something of that nature, but I do not, I cannot, I don't have the time to be committed to an ongoing so many, so many shows per month or year or whatever it is. Is there a special yet untold story that you cherish and that you'd like to do? In television? You yes. Mean? Well, I've, I've always thought that, uh, yes, the, the, the answer is yes to that. Uh, uh, whether I would have the time to do is another matter. I don't What's think so. What's the subject? But the, the subject would be, uh, would be international and, and world events. I, I, uh, I'm distressed over the fact that there has been a, a decrease and almost a, a shutoff of the amount of material that's shown in the United States about the rest of the world of a serious nature. What's happening in Europe? Um, what's, ha what's happening to the Scandinavian experiment? Does it work or not? Um, is Africa going to explode? The Middle East? All we get is news shots and news clips of this, but with the in-depth stuff is very, very small. And I would like to see that expanded. And I'd like to see our conversation expanded. And perhaps when you come back, you'll tell us several other of the untold stories. Okay. Special <laughs> thanks to you, John Lindsay, for joining us. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. And thanks to you, audience, for being with us, too. Uh -huh.